हाय आई एम राहुल फाउंडर एंड सीईओ ऑफ फ्लोबिस एक मिनट रुक जाओ रेडी होने दो चलो ये कर लेते हैं दिस कुड बी अ ग्रेट इंट्रो हाय आई एम अक्षय हाय दिस इज सौरभ एंड यू आर लिसनिंग टू द फाउंडर थीसिस पॉडकास्ट we meet some of the most celebrated startup founders in the country and we want to learn how to build a unicorn there is an advantage of being the first mover to a market but sometimes entering a market too early can be as difficult as entering it too late and crypto is one such space which has seen a roller coaster journey of ups and downs This is the story of a bunch of smart young founders who built a crypto exchange based on personal frustration with the available crypto exchanges and quickly became the fastest growing crypto exchange of the country. But then came the so-called crypto winter when an order from the RBI cut off the industry from access to formal banking channels causing the whole market to go into meltdown. In this episode of the Founder Thesis podcast, Rahul Raj talks to Akshay Dutt about setting up India's fastest growing crypto exchange just one year after completing his BTech from IIT Kharagpur. I was born and brought up in Patna. That's my hometown. I uh, come from a family of all servicemen. So, uh, you know, wanted to prepare for the IIT JEE exams. Uh, in the appearing attempt, I could not qualify the JEE exam. I uh, had to convince my family to give me another chance. I was fortunate enough to land at the oldest and the largest also in IIT Kharagpur and uh, uh, the stream that I enrolled myself into was mathematics and computing. One of the you know one of the life's biggest advices that I received in my first year itself was that this this uh, two years senior from my hostel told me uh, cracking the IIT probably would be the biggest achievement that you have now if after your course completion this continues to be your biggest achievement that's a failure i was also fortunate enough to end up in the company of a couple of seniors who were trying to do their own startup in the edtech space i also was fortunate enough to uh, become a part of the entrepreneurship cell at iit kharagpur in the first year itself so these two things together actually opened my horizon to say that you you are now picking up a technical skill that actually does not only land up with a job but actually creates the opportunity so uh, in the two years at entrepreneurship cell and in the brief stint as an intern i was uh, vastly exposed there i began to participate in uh, competitions that were you know uh, entrepreneurship related uh, i actually was the captain of the team that qualified for halt international prize which is a social entrepreneurship challenge uh uh from india i was the only finalist team uh in the boston regional finals i represented it kharagpur in india there uh i set up a hmm. that, that was like a business plan competition but with a social angle that's a b plan competition but with a social angle exactly and uh, uh, i ended up setting up uh, kharagpur's first online food delivery system that was used by all all professors all students all working staff and went beyond into the kharagpur town also even though it's not that big a town but it became the first uh, food delivery startup there so all of that happened we tried to scale this in uh, hyderabad uh, so i dropped the opportunity to do internships in corporates like my friends did and took along with my co-founder uh, the uh, uh, challenge to scale this in hyderabad But how, how much money did you get? Like uh, that grant? How much was it? This was five lakh rupees. This was five lakh rupees. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't too much, but enough to uh, keep us fed and pay for the rent in the uh, uh, city of Hyderabad. And we were trying to do our best, but by then Zomato, uh, Food Panda, Swiggy, all of these guys had already exploded. Had begun to onboard restaurants in uh, uh, nearly every vicinity. so because of these parameters and because uh, uh, you know there is family pressure to sit at the placements and what not we chose to uh, you know uh, put a halt there and sat for placements both my co-founder and i both of us got uh, uh, you know very well placed uh, both of us crank day one got placed on, on your linkedin i can see you were a content analyst like uh, how was that like relevant for your education so uh, the the thing was that uh, you know i was hired as a content analyst but as part of the uh, entire onboarding journey uh, at the organization we were made to write these shorts that you read of the product 
So, uh, you know, I, I realized that uh, this is a very niche business. It does not have very wide applicability. And uh, uh, it will also restrict uh, the dimensions in which I could see myself grow professionally. So I joined Bizongo then. Uh, I was hired as their first product manager. So uh, Bizongo is another, uh, uh, you know, uh, tech startup by IT Bombay and Delhi Grants. And it used to be a B2B packaging procurement marketplace. That is where I met my co-founders, Aditya and Rakesh. The three of us coincidentally also had a common, uh, uh, you know, interest in the entire blockchain and Bitcoin space. So we had been following the space independently. We kept on talking about all of that. And December of 2016 is where I joined, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bizongo. And uh, uh, that is when we began to invest whatever little money we had into getting our hands on crypto. But uh, the problem was that, uh, you know, you could get it from a couple of places and you could only get, let's just say, Bitcoin and Ether in India. And for any other crypto activity, you had to move that crypto to a global platform. So we began doing uh, the same thing. We became part of uh, Telegram groups, WhatsApp groups, Facebook communities and whatnot. Began to interact with other people in the space. We began to look at blockchain challenges and began to dabble our hands into, uh, you know, uh, prototype development in the blockchain infrastructure and stuff like that. But uh, uh, we continue to trade and participate in ICOs or look at a, a bunch of other developments happening in the space in parallel. Uh, I distinctly remember that uh, the three of us over, uh, you know, lunch breaks or drink breaks or whatever we used to hang out with, uh, you know, we used to uh, uh, keep on chatting about what we could do, uh, uh, what is happening. Do you have something new for, uh, uh, you know, the group to learn? All of that conversation kept on happening, which is how we ended up identifying that the three of us could actually work together. And it uh, worked out beautifully. So in, uh, in uh, uh, May of 2017, we quit our jobs. Uh, we set out to uh, build a crypto exchange in the country because we had identified the difference between the quality of platforms globally and what was existing in the country. And hearing from so many places and so many communities that they are fed up with, uh, uh, you know, whatever was present in India, it was practically everything was absent. It felt like a massive opportunity with a na uh, you know, narrow window. So uh, uh, we had to uh, uh, jump the gun on this and actually make a quick hard call. So uh, the three of us, along with another uh, uh, Bizongo team member, the four of us quit and began to uh, write the code for uh, getting the exchange up and running. Within a span of three months or so, we were able to release the exchange as well. Uh, all four of you were like hands-on coders? like uh, Two of them uh, were hands-on developers. I was more of a product UI, UX and stuff like that. Uh, Aditya, Aditya was more into uh, uh, getting the ops in place getting the banking in place. Uh, 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 together, all four of us used to do all customer support. So practically everybody did a bit of everything. But uh, uh, when it came to writing code, the two guys along with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rakesh included, that was uh, uh, the entire work for getting the exchange infrastructure in place. Uh, I guess at that time, uh, uh, like uh, probably uh, Wazirx and Unocoin would have been the only other exchanges around, right? I don't even think Wazirx. It was the uh, Uno Coin, Zeppe, and Quite Secure were the platforms that were available back then. But they were mostly, uh, you know, sort of like brokers and not uh, exchanges uh, to draw that distinction. So a broker would set the price for purchase and sell, and an exchange would be a, an open marketplace with a complete order book. So you can see the price that is getting discovered. You can see the volume of trades and stuff like that. And there's more of a peer-driven uh, uh, market liquidity that sets the asset price rather than a broker saying, this is what I will buy at and this is what I'll sell at. So that was the difference. So uh, Coinex was launched on 25th August of uh, 2017. This became India's first open order book multi-currency crypto exchange. The entire tech was proprietary. We wrote all of that in-house in a span of three months. Uh, it grew on to become the largest in a span of four and a half months since its inception. So by December of 2017, uh, uh, you know, when we saw the first formal and proper uh, uh, global Bitcoin bull run, uh, we were clocking about $265 million of daily trade volume on the product. And this I'm talking about in a span of uh, four and a half months. For some cryptocurrencies, we became globally top five fiat to crypto exchanges. So it was incredible. And uh, uh, the thing was that 
we were the ideal customers, right? So we actually set out to build something that we would have wanted in an ex- Indian exchange. So it wasn't as much as saying we waited for customer feedback to know what we have to build. We just knew what to build. And then we just kept on building it with velocity. Uh, uh, it was incredible. And, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, the journey for Coinex, before we get to the discussion on Flowbase, but the journey for Coinex, I would say, has been the most concise, power packed uh, uh, learning and intense grueling period of my life ever. Uh, so basically, if you look at the entire uh, uh, stock market, you've got multiple entities doing multiple things. You've got a depository, you've got an exchange, you've got a regulator, you've got a trade settlement and banking and whatnot. Uh, in a crypto setting, all of these functions are supposed to be executed by the exchange itself. So you have to build wallet, you have to build order book, you have to build customer support, you have to build banking, all of that you have to do yourself. And you have to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, this works in tandem and uh, like in well-oiled machinery 24-7. Because unlike a stock market that cuts off at 3.30 p.m., it, it was absolutely the opposite here. It runs 24-7. And when India sleeps, the West wakes and the activity continues. So that way, a lot of the development and movement that happens in the West began to translate with a trickle down in India as well. So you have to make sure that the exchange runs 24-7. Plus, you're always paranoid about security, right? Because this is dealing with people's money. And I'm giving you a sense of the scale that we were operating at. So uh, when we were doing $265 million of daily trade volume, we were onboarding uh, 20 to 40,000 customers daily. So, and all of this had zero, zero marketing spend. Totally India. Totally India, all fully KYC, but uh, zero marketing spend. That is the kind of pull that uh, uh, the market has. But then uh, uh, we suffered a knee-jerk reaction from the regulator in April of 2018 when uh, uh, they came out with the directive to uh, hamstring and block formal banking channels from uh, uh, dealing in cryptocurrency trades. That resulted into account closures, transactions getting blocked, offices getting served and whatnot. It was quite... uh, it was quite incredible and uh, quite scary, to be honest, because here you are in a, a massively growing business. And then all of a sudden, it feels like the ground is slipped beneath it because you are now in no longer access of any banking infrastructure. And it, uh, uh, in our minds, the problem was so huge because we were the first and the largest exchange in the country. Uh, the problem was, the problem felt so huge to us that what happens if our, all of our accounts get frozen? And then you are in no access of your own cash, which means you can't pay for rent, electricity, and salary. That was, that was uh, uh, you know, uh, pretty hard. So we, uh, uh, you know, experimented and pivoted with a couple of models internally. So peer-to-peer trading, crypto-to-crypto market trading. We did all of that, but uh, uh, soon realized that uh, in absence of banking infrastructure, this isn't a business that, uh, uh, you know, we ideally set out to build. So I think uh, that is when it became clear to us that uh, uh, till the time there is a proper licensing regime and a framework, all of which we are more than happy to comply by. In fact, we did out of our way efforts to make sure that we were heard and represented. We offered to uh, build dashboards. We offered to build API connections. We offered to self-regulate because we were already doing a lot of these things. We worked with industry participants and, uh, uh, you know, trade groups to uh, offer all of that knowledge. And actually, uh, the idea was that if you look at how this blockchain ecosystem is developing, exchanges probably will always be at the epicenter of all of this blockchain development. Once you are able to convert your fiat to any kind of digital token, you will then be in access of Web3 products. So that that layer has to be there. So we actually believe that from the exchange, which actually definitely is a cash cow business, but from the exchange infrastructure, we will be able to develop the ecosystem that can help India leapfrog from wherever it was to wherever it can be and uh, actually put put it on the frontier of the, uh, you know, uh, technological map on the globe. And we could actually do a lot of this because we are a 1.4 billion people. So that way, this could have had tremendous impact. It, it's by far the last market uh, across all sectors. So that way, I think, uh, you know, that was the expectation, but uh, uh, we couldn't really sustain that in absence of licensing framework that continues to be the case that plagues this industry even today. 
we personally continue to be big believers in the blockchain tech and uh, it fundamentally wants to redefine how accountability works how transparency of information works how store of value and transfer of value can be more efficient and uh, democratized so it, it fundamentally challenges the current infrastructure which means it has to be looked at with even more vigor if we were all moving forward as a as a global economic setup so i think that is what is uh, required in this industry but uh, having went having gone through all of this uh, in 2019 summer is when we shut the exchange business down and pivoted to flowbiz if you like to hear stories of founders then we have tons of great stories from entrepreneurs who have built billion dollar businesses just search for the founder thesis podcast on any audio streaming app like spotify gana apple podcasts and subscribe to the show before you start on flow with i have questions on the exchange biz so uh, did you raise funding for coinex or was it all like funded through transaction value like uh, it, it definitely it was generating a lot of cash but uh, in the early days we actually did two rounds so one seed and one pre series a we did two rounds of uh, institution in fact the interesting thing is that <laughs> pre launch of the exchange when we went to indian vcs all of them said no nobody was willing to touch nobody was willing to entertain people wanted to learn and uh, people enjoyed the chats he is ready nahi hai yeah we don't understand the space well enough uh, uh, do we have color on what the regulatory framework is going to be for this there were all sorts of questions on legit but <laughs> my expectation was that if for a young team looking to raise a small sum of capital if that kind of a bet will not be taken by the guardians of or uh, you know enablers of uh, uh, venture businesses then who else do i go to with the expectation of getting some cash for uh, setting up a blockchain business it it felt, felt a little weird and disappointing also but then uh, we were able to raise a couple of rounds uh, uh, both in 2017 one in october and one in december back to back uh, we were able to do uh, a couple of rounds there and uh, the the business was generating cash so uh, before we could look at a mega scale expansion diversification and what not the knee jerk reaction actually set us back Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Obviously, no investors wanted to touch it after that, right? Okay. Now, uh, when you uh, so you essentially uh, told me that compared to Uno Coin and Wazirex, you were building a peer-to-peer exchange. So, uh, how did you build liquidity for that? I mean, won't you need a lot of supply for that to work for for, for people to get good pricing there? absolutely and i was expecting this question also uh, there are two three parameters here one you build a killer product so no matter you are a buyer or a seller you would want to be part of a killer product or use a killer product so that automatically began to attract a lot of folks the second was that uh, we kept the sell side free so we only monetize on the buy side so sellers had incentive because they are not getting charged but they still able to make arbitrage and the third was that that encourages liquidity and the third was that we began to dabble into uh, all the pools that existed no matter how discreet to actually uh, find people physically go meet them convince them speak with them try to get them on board to generate initial liquidity and uh, given that we were a multi currency exchange uh, even if it began p- picking up let's say in one coin automatically it can have a trickle down effect for the other markets also <laughs> so because you were in these telegram groups and also you had access to people with coins and you could convince them to right right got it okay hmm. and then once you the then becomes a flywheel like once you have liquidity then everyone comes for liquidity which again further increases liquidity absolutely absolutely and we were very fast with uh, very fast with deployments so whether that's supporting a hard fork or whether that's listing a new coin or whether that's opening a new corridor coinex used to be uh, uh, the exchange at the top of all of this so if a, if a coin gets listed at some other place in the world and if that is a coin that we believe is a good asset for people to actually uh, play around with then within a span of 2 to 4 days you would find that coin on coinex also 
So that way, what happens globally quickly began to happen in India also. And that speed of execution was uh, massively impressive. Hmm, 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 hmm. Uh, and again, this was driven because you would have wanted to buy those coins. So you built it with your needs in mind. Hmm. Uh, you said uh, new corridor. What What does that mean? New corridor? So, uh, so uh, let's just say between coins, can you also trade, uh, let's just say, Bitcoin, Ether, Bitcoin, Ripple and stuff like that? So those corridors you can open or no, that was also contingent on how this would drive liquidity. So even if let's just say direct direct INR corridor is not supported for a cryptocurrency or a digital asset, but it is supported in a crypto to crypto corridor. And if you're able to get one coin with fiat, then that market automatically has, or that corridor automatically has liquidity. Got it. Got it. Okay. And uh, what do you mean by supporting a hard fork, like for people who are not from the space just to... So uh, what happens is that uh, uh, in a blockchain, basically it's a global consensus, right? So on the code that is deployed for that functioning of the blockchain, if there is to uh, make a fundamentally different deployment or development on that blockchain, which can result into massive upgrade, then uh, uh, protocols have the opportunity to fork. What that means is that uh, you can split that asset into two different assets. Uh, it can split in one is to one ratio, or it can split in a different ratio also depending on how that uh, 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 hard fork goes about. But let's, let's assume that it's a one to one uh, uh, ratio. Then that way, the old set of code will continue to run that uh, uh, blockchain. And the new set of code that gets deployed will create a new token and can get a separate uh, uh, blockchain of its own, all powered by that same mechanism and that same infrastructure with the difference of the code that is deployed. But till that uh, point of uh, uh, diversification, the blocks continue to be the same and the transactions continue to be recorded the same way. And then at the time of the hard fall, you have a new asset that belongs to you. If you have, let's just say, one coin, you will have one more coin. So if there is a hard fork and you support that, then that means people now automatically have in that ratio another asset that belongs to them. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, give me examples of hard forks. Like w w what are some hard forks which happened? Like So Bitcoin went into a hard fork and created Bitcoin Cash, for example. So this happened in 2017, September or October, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. So Bitcoin went into a protocol level upgrade and that split the chain into two parts. Bitcoin continued to be Bitcoin and then there was another chain called Bitcoin Cash. It was split one, one to one. So everybody that had X number of Bitcoin had X number of Bitcoin Cash as well. And then it trades as a separate asset itself. Okay. But I think Bitcoin Cash is not such a big deal, right? Like uh, nobody talks of Bitcoin Cash prices and... Yeah, yeah, not not too many people talk about it. It still continues to be, uh, you know, of value. Uh, that's for sure, and it continues to be of uh, at least decent value even today. But uh, uh, one thing that is very interesting to point out here is that it is all about perceptions and uh, uh, you know collective trust, because no nothing has intrinsic value of its own, including the currencies that we use today, uh, the fiat currencies. So if let's just say uh, the entire globe believes that the original Bitcoin is the Bitcoin that all of us value, then obviously Bitcoin Cash, even after the split, will not have as much value as compared to the original BTC. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And um, uh, how does, uh, you know, th there is this concept of wallet, hot wallet, cold wallet and stuff like that. And, you know, can you explain that? Like when people uh, come to the platform and bring their crypto with them uh, like the, is that stored by you in the platform or like how does that happen like that storage of uh, like you know the work that a depository does in a traditional stock exchange yes that you have to do because uh, b uh, blockchains are pretty complicated to a uh, common layman if you look at a transaction hash or a wallet address on a blockchain uh, it's it's not something that you can remember. It's not something that is intuitive to understand. It's alphanumeric string, very long string. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, to make it so secure, it runs those kinds of encryption algorithms. So from a layman UX point of view, it's highly suboptimal. It continues to be that problem even today. There, there are protocols trying to solve that at some level uh, with, let's just say, uh, names that you can attach to wallets and stuff like that. But still uh, uh you know not a problem that has been solved in full uh 
So since most of the people were entering the crypto space that time, uh, you needed to bring out an infrastructure and interface that people would be intuitively uh, open to adopting. So that way you had to build the entire wallet architecture yourself. We did that ourselves. And what you're asking has two, dip, uh, two fronts. One, you're talking about the hot, cold, uh, warm wallet architecture. And the other, you're talking about how it feels for people. What is the role of the depository and stuff like that. So it's basically a colorless pool that gets accumulated when all people are trading on the same uh, uh, you know, market. What is the, uh, I mean, colorless pool? Why do you use this word colorless here? Uh, what I mean is that uh, there is a jackpot. And everybody is trying to, uh, you know, uh, exchange values within this jackpot. So you and I, along with a million other people, put our BTC here. Or you and I, along with a million other people, put our INR here. For the exchange, it becomes a consolidated pool with a representation of the wallet balances. So when we treat the consolidated wallet amounts, that is a colorless pool. We have on the exchange a total of these many bitcoins, these many INR rupees and stuff like that. But there is a there is a representation for individual account holders to say, this is the amount of BTC you have. This is the amount of rupees that you have in the wallet. So that is how it's constructed. It allows for faster settlement and, uh, uh, you know, secure trading. Because then you are able to uh, uh, maintain all of this in such a way that... Uh, the largest part of the entire pool is always offline. So uh, in anticipation for any kind of attacks or any kind of leakages or any kind of misgivings uh, uh, on the product, you are able to uh, uh, secure, let's just say, 99.9% .9 of the total holdings. So at most, at risk is, let's just say, 0.01% or 0.1% that you have exposed. And that has been exposed only in the interest of the customer to be able to make an instantaneous withdrawal if they were to take their crypto from an exchange and port it to some other exchange. Otherwise, it would have to go through the offline uh, uh, you know, infrastructure. And to do that manually for uh, uh, lakhs of customers was absolutely painful. So you maintain this combination of hot and cold wallets that suffices for the immediate use case of instantaneous withdrawals of cryptos while ensuring that there is massive safeguarding protocols for the protection of the total pools. Hmm. So you could do 99% uh, offline because people were transacting with each other. Therefore, there was no need for that money to flow out of CoinEx. It remained with CoinEx within your... It's it, it just the representations changed. Like, uh, but the total amount stayed in. So, So you didn't really need to... Uh, you only needed to take care of withdrawals. Otherwise, regular transactions you didn't need. So that's why it could be offline. Uh, anecdotally for CoinEx, I can tell you that uh, the inflow, which is the deposit of cryptos, was always higher than the withdrawals. So once people brought their cryptos in, they actually kept their cryptos on CoinEx. They had comfort of using the wallet. They had comfort of treating this as an investment platform. They had comfort of treating this as a trading platform. Uh, doing uh, rapid tradings and whatnot, all of those things were possible uh, for uh, uh, you know investors and traders. So that way, I think uh, uh, you know the deposits were always larger than withdrawals by a large margin. So that also enabled us to do this more properly. Hmm. Okay, and you said this was like a cash cow or a cash generating business. Uh, what was the uh, uh, what, what's the maths of the cash like? What what is it that you charge and is it per transaction or what is it like? Yeah, per buy trade, it used to vary from uh, uh, 0 0.1 to 0.3% of the volume. Okay, so, okay, okay. Every time someone buys, so that 0 0.01 or 0 0.03 amount uh, uh, goes into your, uh, uh, your wallet, so to say, and, and the remaining is transferred to the buyer. Hmm. Okay. So, but your earning would also be in crypto, then you could convert that crypto into rupee or was your earning in rupee? Like this is buy side, this is buy side monetization, right? So for buying, you are paying INR. Okay. But what if it's a corridor? Like if someone is buying Ethereum using Bitcoin? That is exactly, that is exactly the reason why only to, only crypto to crypto in absence of banking cannot work. Because if you're only earning in crypto, then how do you pay salaries, right? Because we had a, we had a massively strict policy 
of nobody, including the founders, can trade on CoinEx. So all of the team members who were working at CoinEx, none of them had accounts on CoinEx. So it was purely, purely transparent. And in fact, uh, we meant such, we, you know, we maintained such a discretion that apart from the core leadership team, people didn't even have uh, ideas of the next coins that were uh, going to get listed because it can manipulate a lot of that uh, uh, activity, right? Uh, so we used to maintain, yeah. So we used to maintain that high levels of secrecy and, uh, 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 you know, uh, integrity for the exchange, which was also something that our traders and users not just knew, but massively appreciated. Even today, we keep on getting messages. When is CoinX coming back? Why don't you restart CoinX? We get that even in 2021. So when you took the call to shut down CoinX, uh, like, did you have cash left over to help you in your next venture or had it run out by then? No, we had cash. Uh, we had cash and we had the support of the team also, uh, which is why we had the luxury of taking a step back to reevaluate and reassess what opportunity we can go after next. So did you like shut down that entity and start a new entity or uh, just pivoted the business? No, we didn't. We didn't. We uh, shut down that entity and moved to a new entity altogether and transported all that we could. Uh, the the interesting thing about where we are today and what we are doing today is that it's a 180 degree flip from what we were doing back then. It was building for the future in a frontier tech space, uh, uh, you know, in a decentralized environment and whatnot. And we are now building in the traditional financial services space for a very uh, traditional audience segment. Uh, uh, on the uh, on one hand, the entire crypto and blockchain space promises for, uh, you know, a global uh, uh, footprint. And on the other hand, today this business is uh, largely focused on uh, uh, the Indian small businesses. So it's a 180 degree flip in so many respects. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, we had the opportunity to do this because we continue to be inspired and uh, excited about what we are doing today. Stay tuned for part two of this conversation where Rahul talks about building India's leading fintech platform for SMEs, Flowbiz. If you like the Founder Thesis podcast, then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing, technology, career advice, books and drama. Visit the podium.in, that is T H E P O D I U M dot I N for a complete list of all our shows. Before we end the episode, I want to share a bit about my journey as a podcaster. I started podcasting in 2020, and in the last two years, I've had the opportunity to interview more than 250 founders who are shaping India's future across sectors. If you also want to speak to the best minds in your field and build an enviable network, then you must consider becoming a podcaster. And the first step to becoming a podcaster starts with Zencaster, which takes care of all the nuts and bolts of podcasting, from remote recording to editing to distribution and finally monetization. If you are planning to check out the platform, then please show your support for the Founder Thesis podcast by using this link zen.ai slash founder thesis that's zen.ai slash founder thesis slash founder thesis slash founder thesis slash founder thesis slash founder thesis